All right, on this week's episode, we have Arabelle Higgins, who ran the Grayson Highlands 50K this past weekend. I also have Sarah Mullins, who ran the Grayson Highlands 50 miler. They both have some really awesome, awesome stories. Both of them are good friends of mine. They've been volunteering for our, our races for years now. Um, their families are part of our events. It's just they're awesome, 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 inspiring women. So let's get to the podcast. Hi, my name is Sean Blanton, but my friends call me Sean Michael or Run Bump. I've run over 300 ultra marathons. I've been first, last, and everything in between. I started and owned Run Bum Races, where we put on 11 trail and ultra running races a year from Central Florida to Southern Virginia. I hope that with my trail running and race directing experience that I can help you train smarter, run further, and fall in love with trail running. If you find this podcast helpful and or entertaining, please help me out by sharing it. I'd also like to invite you to run or volunteer at one of our mini races. Welcome, friends, to the Bend Don't Break podcast. This past weekend at the Grayson Highlands Trail Run was absolutely incredible. Um, the week leading into the race, we had all this like forecast calling for just horrendous, horrendous uh, weather on Saturday. Pretty much rain all day, blanketed fog, whiteout conditions. And so uh, as a race director, I am fully obligated to keep everyone safe. Like that's the number one priority. Yes, we want everyone to have fun, stay on course, have great food at the aid stations, have a good time after the event. But ultimately what it boils down to is keeping everybody safe. So every race, I try to let people know what's going on. I am no meteorologist, meteorologist myself, but I do my best to assess weather and also give people resources where they can assess weather. I put out there my own opinions, what happens and what people do with that is up to them. Um, so like I put that out there and sure enough, the day before the race, we had the forecast change completely. Uh, it did not rain at all the entire weekend. In fact, as we were putting everything back up, loading it into the trailer on Sunday, as soon as we, I swear to God, as soon as we closed uh, the rear door of the trailer, the skies opened up and it just, or, uh, you know, just downpoured and we drove away. So that was very, very, very lucky. So I think a lot of people uh, planned for horrible weather and then it was very sunny. It actually got pretty warm. Um, out of all the events that we do, Grayson Highlands is definitely the largest event that we do for all four distances from the eight miler, the half marathon on Sunday, and of course the 50 mile and the 50K on Saturday. Um, in previous editions of this, um, the race had been like 50K had been about 27 and a half miles. And then the 50 miler had been um, last couple of years have been like about 44. Reason for that being is um, I truly believe in not trying to force mileage um, and let stuff be what it is. Um, but really the last uh, about two years ago, my dad got in a horrible, horrible wreck on Wednesday leading into the Grayson Highlands race. Um, he totaled both his SUV, my mom's SUV, and the trailer that we were pulling. And so basically, as I was going out there to start flagging, I get this horrible news and I had to drive two and a half hours one way. So I lost an entire half day or entire day of flagging. And so basically, it was helter skelter to, to get everything flagged as much as possible. And we kind of shortened it. Um, but now it's back to being. Um, 30 miles, 30, 30 and a half miles. So right on a 50 K more or less for the 50 K and the 50 milers about 48 and change. Um, some people got 47 and a half. Other people are coming in at 51. So you know how that goes. So uh, there's just a wide variety, but regardless of the distance, the whole goal is to not have BS or just mileage just to get mileage. So I truly believe that these races from the wild ponies um, to the wide open views to waterfalls, single track, running through the fir trees, watching the sunrise from certain points, depending on what races you're running, um, from the after party, if you will, um, to you know just the pre-race hype, all the photos you can take in the park, you know the cows, everything. I just think it's from start to finish. I think it's the most beautiful race that we do. Um, the race is actually going on sale. 
Tuesday, May 16th. So if you're ever thinking about doing this race, it will sell out immediately. Uh, every single year we've had us, I think this is going on year eight or nine of this. Uh, it sold out every single year, months and months and months in advance. And so this year we're putting it on early and we're going to uh, open it up like, you know, what, a week and a half after. So make sure you guys get registered. And yeah, it's an awesome race. It's a destination race. If you're not familiar with my races, um, a lot of them are destination things. It's not just stuff. Oh, this is a 10 minute drive, 30 minute drive from town. It's these are areas that I know I love and I care about. And I want to share them with other people in a respectable way and uh, a sustainable way as well. So I was excited. We got to clear a bunch of trees. Uh, Deanna Doan, my co-race director and I went out there uh, early the weekend before, just after the Brasstown Bald Buster 5K, which was super fun. I got to run my own race. Uh, it's always fun. Um, usually there's too much stuff going on, too many variables where I, you know, that I can't do that. Um, so thank you, Deanna, for letting me do that. But we went out there and we, we chainsawed about 30 trees off the 50 mile course. The rest of the course, the park took care of, which is incredible. Grayson Highland State Park staff is amazing. Uh, Marcy Holland, um, you know, and everybody out there is just works their butts off just for this event. They love it. It's, which is really cool. It's so great. Um, where, you know, here in Georgia, um, you know, state park staff are really nice, but the higher, higher ups are kind of making it harder for us uh, to do events. If you haven't heard, you know, with increasing fees astronomically, whereas in Virginia, it's like, how can we help make this a positive event um, from all the way from the top to the bottom? So I really appreciate that. It's, it's, it's amazing. And um, I hope everybody had a really good time. And I hope everybody got the wild, beautiful, scenic experience, regardless of the distance that they ran. One thing that I think was really cool is we had a 90, it was about a 95% finish rate between all of the races. That's incredible. Let me say that again, a 95% finish rate for everybody who showed up and started the race. That was cool. Um, that, that makes me extremely happy. It means that people were, tr were training, trained, hopefully, um, or they were just so stubborn <laughs> that they kept going. So, um, didn't see too many people who are, looked like they shouldn't be out there. So hats off to everybody who showed up. And for those of you guys who may not have been on that level yet this year and signed up and, and, uh, you know, had to cancel. I hope that next year that we can see you at this race. You get trained up, uh, you get healthy, uh, whatever might have prevented you from from getting out there. Um, another thing that was really, really crazy was Scott Abshire, who is my um, photographer, videographer, good friend. He's not really on Facebook. He's on Instagram at, at Scott A. Pants, Scott A. Pants. Um, he's extremely talented, very funny, great runner, ultra runner as well. He just did the falling uh, waters. 100k the weekend before and then came out to grace and that was really cool but he actually uh, on sunday i got um a phone call from him saying that hey somebody has broken their leg and they're not able to move and so i called uh the park manager we initiated a rescue turns out they weren't actually part of our race it was a woman out there hiking with her daughter um, I was scrambling to get down there because I've been involved in rescues before. If you hadn't heard my Heiner podcast, I was just involved in carrying somebody out in a basket. But Scott is an amazing human and also a girl named Emily and her friend. Emily had run the 50K the day before. They stayed with this woman, actually helped carry her out. Um, so it was a multiple hour rescue, um, which puts things in perspective how real um, and how bad things can go and how much effort it takes. Um, so Scott, you're an amazing human. I appreciate you for doing that. Uh, that's, that's awesome. So that's what the trail running family is all about is helping other people, even if they're not part of the running family. So tip of the hat to you, my friend. All right. Our next guest is one of my good friends, Arabelle Higgins from Canton, Georgia is now where she resides with her beautiful husband, Richard Higgins, and an awesome house that they let me come visit them at. Uh, Arabelle is a many time ultra marathon finisher. She also coaches people online. We'll get into that more. She's one of the very few people that I recommend that not only you get to know as a person, but also you consider hiring as a coach because she's amazing. Arabelle, welcome on. 
Thank you, Sean. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm digging the overalls, man. <sighs> Thank you. I've been in the garden today. Oh, oh what, yeah. what, are you, what are you growing? Um, I have some blueberries that I was trying to transplant and I'm um, moving all of my kale from my greenhouse out into my raised beds. So big day in the garden. That's awesome. So do you like grow a lot of your own food then? I mean, I try. <laughs> um, like I like, I like gardening. I've always enjoyed gardening this year. I've kind of branched out and I'm working on growing flowers as well, but typically just herbs and vegetables. Yes. And then apparently you're raising a bunch of like wolves over there. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> I have a couple of border collies and, um, oh, wow. they get a little crazy when the neighbors play catch in the front yard with their dog. So <laughs> No worries, no worries. All right. So do you ever think you're going to get to the point? Do you ever think it's like viable? I just think this would be awesome. So you, are you growing edible flowers? Like, Actually, yes. Yes. I have um, a lot of nasturtium planted. And um, I didn't know what that is. Nasturtium, what is they're real pretty. You see, them in, you see them in salads and fancy restaurants, essentially. Right. That's, <laughs> um, why, that's why I haven't seen it. Right. Okay. Um, and I'm growing a lot of, a lot of flowers and herbs that I can use for teas. So I'm growing some Tulsi. I'm growing, um, oh yeah. A lot of like Indian herbs that I can put in teas and I'm actually growing patchouli this year for the first time. Sweet. Yeah. That's about as hippie as it gets. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is. <laughs> Do you think you'll ever be at the point where you're going to be at like mile 50 of an ultra and be like, I just need some edible flowers right now? Um, probably not. I'm, I, I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not, not that would be really so likely. Awesome, though. If I saw somebody at an aid station mm -hmm. eating flowers, I would just, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of dandelions on most courses and you can eat them. So like, you know, in a struggle, I guess you could resort to that, but I don't really know that that's what I would crave at that point. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So let's talk Grayson Highlands. You crushed the 50K. I saw you before. I saw you after. You were like all smiles, yeah. feeling fine. It was like, oh, yeah, it's just like a normal 5K for you is what it looked like. So it was – it was actually a really exciting race for me. Um, I know you got to meet my mom at the finish line, but this was the first time that my mom has ever seen me finish a race. So it was, it was a really big deal for me. I was really excited about that. Um, I, I had had a little bit of a fail a couple of weeks before I had gone out to run a 200 miler and I think I was ready for the mileage. I had a lot of miles on my legs from pacing clients at a hundred milers in February, March, and April. Um, but all of it was flat. So I really wasn't prepared for the elevation at the race I was in and just, it was great until it wasn't. And I got too slow and made it 80 miles and it just took me down. So I was kind of feeling like I wanted a little redemption, wanted to feel good about something. And I really didn't know what to expect. I mean, I had 80 miles with over 20,000 feet of gain on my legs from two weeks before. So I didn't know if that was just going to make me feel really strong or if it was just going to make me feel beat down. And I really enjoy rocky stuff. Like if it's the rockier it is, the better. Like I feel like it gives me something to do. So the technical downhills to me are my favorite. I often joke about it. Like if I could run everything the way I run a technical downhill, I'd, I'd probably end up a little bit higher on the ultra sign up ranking. Um, <laughs> but I really enjoyed it. It was beautiful. Um, my feet hurt really bad when I was done. And <laughs> yeah, I had a I had a great time out there. I was really surprised at how well it went given that there was a good chance I was just going to be tired. So I felt really great. That's awesome. It's funny. Cause I'm just thinking back, like, cause I've known you for a while uh, yeah. now and it's, I've watched you progress through all this stuff, yeah. which is really awesome. And it was like the longest time it was, uh, you know, wow, I get, I do this 50 mile or whatever, obviously because we talked about the dietary uh, yeah. stuff, you know, it, yeah. it, it's very hard 
you know, your body, it's very hard to fuel your, yeah. your body when you can only do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Um, and I remember you training to do all this stuff on the Duncan Ridge Trail. First, it was 100 miles on this. Then it was mm-hmm. 200 miles. Now you're doing 200 miles at a time. Would you do that uh, Heart of the South, which how many? Yeah. It's like, you know, d- describe to me, and we'll go back to Grayson, but this just popped in my head. It's like that progression of, going from 50 to a hundred miles and then a hundred miles to that, that new unknown. Yeah. So I, I, as you know, I had a lot of struggles with getting to a hundred miles. Um, and, and all of it really was nutrition. I just couldn't wrap my head around my stomach hurts, but it's because I need to eat. And then I would just progressively get weaker and weaker. And then I'd fall behind the cuts. And I made it to about 80, 85 miles of many hundred milers um, before I got cut. And it took, it really took for me, incidentally, becoming a coach. The whole reason that I started my coaching certification, my ultra running coaching certification was just because I felt like there's got to be something I don't know about. There's got to be some trick to this or some method that I'm not following. And I had been in fitness. I'd been coaching fitness for about 15 years at the time. So it was really kind of just adding another certification to the list. But I felt like I had a, a personal investment in it. And I had struggled to finish even one hundred miler a year up until then. And then the year that I completed my certification, I thought, well, I'm just going to try this out on myself and see what happens. And I completed five hundreds that first year. And yeah, and felt really great. Two of them were two weeks apart, which was really a shocker to me that and and I finished them literally within like three or four minutes of the same finish time. Um, I felt really, really great. And, you know, and there's always that, well, if I could do this, what else could I do? And, you know, 200 became kind of a, a goal for me. Um, and then Heart of the South came up and it, it wasn't really anything that I had ever thought about, but I had spent some time up at Frozen Head or at, um, up in in Warburg and I was helping out during Big's Backyard and had some conversations with, um, with Lazarus Lake during the weekend. We talked a lot about these journey runs because, you know, my first argument was, I don't ever want to do that. I'm not a road runner, but the more we talked about it and the way he presented it, it really did become appealing and, I went home the next day and registered. So um, awesome. it was really like... The, How far is that for everybody who doesn't know? Uh, 327 miles, self, <laughs> completely self-supported. So no crew, no aid. Um, wow. A lot of... A lot of unexpected things. Like I really thought the running was going to be the hard part. Like I was intimidated by that. I didn't know what my legs were going to do after 150, 200 miles. And then I realized pretty quickly that the running was the easy part of that race. It was just navigating everything else and finding safe places to sleep and figuring out Mm -hmm. how to budget, how much food I had on my back to get to the next town. And it was, it was really a challenge, but I felt like the hot days were really difficult. But then as soon as the sun would go down, I'd get my running legs back and I could crank out a 50 K during the night. Like I felt really good. So yeah, I really enjoy those long distances. I'm going to go back and try this 200 that I just DNF'd a couple weeks ago. I'll go back and try it again next year. Every year I say I'm done, but I I know already that I'm not. (laughs) So I'll be back out there. That's that. I think that's awesome. That says like a lot about you. It's like I'm, I'm the same way. If I have a, you know, a DNF something or a bad race at something, I'm like I've got to go back and get it. And it's hard because yeah. you want to go do it the next weekend. I know, you know? right? And yeah. Like you got to wait a year. And, <laughs> yeah. And who knows what'll happen in that time? Uh, right. Right. I, I think you hit something right, the nail on the head earlier. I want to go back to. Uh, we're talking about nutrition um, and why you were. Uh, having to stop at 80, 85 miles in. I watched this at like a lot of races and it just doesn't make sense to me. It's like if you run or push your body long enough, um, like on a nonstop basis, like you don't take a big break or you're not every mm-hmm. single day. But if you're going like a 100 mile, 200 mile event, whatever it is, 
at some point eating is going to be a chore. Mm. Like, and I watch people all the time, like mm. all the time. Um, they're like, Oh man, like Georgia death race, prime example. I don't know what it is about that race, but people come to like, I haven't eaten anything for 30 miles. And I'm just thinking like, man, you, uh, that's, that's a, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, but that's also horrible for your body because then you start eating muscle breakdown, mm-hmm. you know, you get organ fit. I mean, all sorts of horrible things, renal failure, you know, so that, but it's like, I, I've gotten to the point before in races where it's like, I am not eating for pleasure. I'm eating yeah. because this keeps me, this gives me energy and fuel to keep yep. going. Yeah. Right. And I, and I can't believe how many people it's like, if you're messed up, you're throwing up, you're doing whatever. It's like, you better figure a way to either slow down, stop, take a break or do whatever yeah. you got to do to get yeah. nutrition back in you. Because if you can't do that at some point, yeah. you will not be able to keep going. Well, you know, and I, I, I say to my clients too, it's like, you know, you, you get in your car and you drive it until the tank is empty and then you don't get this crazy idea that, oh, well, it's okay that I don't have any more gas and the car's at a complete halt. I'm still going to go a few more miles. Like it doesn't work yeah. that way. No, not, not at all. No. Not at all. So back to, to Grayson, did you yeah. run with anybody? Were you racing? Were you just out for the day? Um, I was just out for the day. Like I said, I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, I did catch up to my lovely husband around mile eight and we just happened to be running together where there was a photographer. So I kind of like that, oh, that it'll, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was great. So, um, yeah, we rarely get a picture together during a race. So that was fun. Um, we talked for a little bit and then, and then I was alone again for quite a while. I met a few people out there at the very end. I did meet a really sweet girl running her first, uh, 50k from Ohio. And, nice. and we talked those last couple miles and, um, and then I looked for her at the finish line and I think she came in when I was like hugging you or hugging my mom or something. And I waited around for her and didn't see her, but I saw in the results that like somebody from Ohio came in right after me. So I'm guessing that was her, but that was really, didn't really spend a lot of time with anyone. I was alone quite a bit out there, but I've gotten a lot better at that. And I'm sure that you remember, um, about four or five years ago when I started running in the mountains, um, that really wasn't the case that I was more comfortable with being alone than not. So I feel like I've come a long way with that, but I really do enjoy being by myself out there. For sure. Did you take any like pony selfies or any photos? Um, No, I typically don't take pictures during races. I, I, my phone goes in the back of my pack in case of an emergency and I always figure if there's something really great that I want a picture of, I'll go back later after the race and get it then. But I, nice. I'd like to stay focused and just kind of be present in the moment and be with it and take it in. And like I said, if there's a picture that needs to be taken, I usually get it later. I love that. What was, uh, so what was your favorite part or favorite parts if you had any at all? <laughs> um, I really, I really enjoy that section and I don't, I can't remember what the trail is called, but maybe you remember. So about four years ago when I was up there with you, we did some trail work before the race. We went down in that where you go down by the water. It's really steep and it's all overgrown. It's like all those trees and foliage down there. I love that part. That Wilson was some Creek trail. Yes. Yeah. With the, ro- yeah. the Roto tunnel. <laughs> yes. I love it. I love it. I think I passed like maybe a dozen people down there, like anything that's like Rocky and Rudy like that, I feel like I can really move on. And then of course I hit the road and I like slow to a snail's pace. But when I'm on, when I'm on that Rocky Rudy stuff, I do really well. Yeah. I love that trail. So that Creek right there is called uh, Wilson Creek, the big okay. Wilson Creek. Yeah. And on the other side of it, that's wilderness. So that's oh, wow. kind of cool. It's just on the other side of the Creek. And then that Creek itself it's kind of brown. If you look at it, it's all from yeah. the tannins of, and they used to tan leather. Oh, wow. In that creek, like, you know, 200 years ago or whatever it, oh, it wow. might be. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a cool area. I like that. And, you know, even though I joked about it with that, like that last loop after we finish the, or we come past the finish line, we have to go back out on that loop. I actually really did like it. 
like I felt like maybe it was because I was close to the end, but I did like that trail. I felt like that trail ran. What's that? It's called Twin Pinnacles. Yeah, I felt like that that trail ran really well, like especially for the end of a race when you've already gone past the finish line, you think you should be done. (laughs) It, It ran surprisingly well. So. I love like honestly there's two trails that are my favorite trails in the in the park itself mm-hmm. that being one of them um mm-hmm. and most people that ever go to that trail just go out and back to like the first viewpoint but I like the whole loop and starting like right around now like right around the when the race was in the next 3 or 4 weeks it's like all of a sudden it's waking up from winter. So you have like a lot of like flowers and stuff blooming out there. I really like that. And I also like that listening rock trail, which was earlier in the beginning where you kind of went down and came back up through the boulder fields. Yeah. I like, I like those. So from a coach's standpoint, what would you recommend as far as training goes specifically for this race? I don't want you to give away (laughs) beans like recipe or anything, but no, I mean, I think that it definitely, it definitely would be beneficial to get training on something technical, like being used to rocks. Um, you know, elevation training is obviously important, but I do want to add here that I had a client from Florida who did the 50 miler and it was his first 50 miler and his first race at elevation with any kind of elevation in it. I mean, he runs flat stuff in Florida and he did a lot of leg strength work. Like we just worked a lot on that. He did a lot of shorter hill repeats because there just weren't any really long climbs in Florida. And, you know, just a lot of up and down stuff that's short, like doing long runs with repeats in the middle of them. And Mm -hmm. he did amazing. So as long as you're getting some uphill, like you definitely need elevation training, but it is possible to do a race like that if you don't live in the mountains but I think that having a little bit of experience on rocks definitely helps because I, I saw a lot of people moving really cautiously through Timid. all of the rocks. Yes, timidly, cautiously. Yeah, just like kind of unsure of their footing and unsure of how to navigate it. And I think just getting out on a trail that's got some good sized rocks on it and just practicing. I mean, that's really the only way to get good at that. And that's a great like that's great because... I know I am very good on technical or rather I consider myself to be Mm -hmm. very good on technical. And I say this because running races while I'm racing all out, I will pass people who are way faster Mm -hmm. than I am. Me too. And I love, I love it. I'm like, man, this guy is probably runs a a 5k a minute or two faster than I I do, but I can just glide across that. And I think a lot of that for me personally is quick feet from playing yep. soccer. I still play soccer. Mm-hmm. I think that helps a lot. Um, Absolutely. But, but I also think too, like the slower you go uh, over, especially downhill on mm-hmm. rocky, uh, rooty stuff, not everything is you step on is going to be solid. Right. 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 So if you're putting all of your weight on every single thing, like yeah. you're more likely to yep. roll or just, you, you don't have that yeah. extra little, yeah. yeah, I work with I work with a client on on technical trail stuff, and she's someone local that I can like get out on the trails with. And one of the things that we always talk about is like, you know, I'll be at the bottom of the hill, like yelling up to her, like giving giving cues, and I was like, "Don't commit, just don't commit." And it's like that quick turnover is really helpful. Exactly what you said. Like if you know if your foot's barely touching it, if it's not stable, it won't matter. But if you're putting all of your confidence into that one step and letting all of your weight come down onto it, and it's not stable, you're gonna go down with it a hundred percent and then the other key to running downhill on technical fast is to be able to have the turnover yeah so if, absolutely. if you're like you know we used to say in uh, ray k famous uh ultra runner uh shout out to ray k um <laughs> but he used to say that he would do speed work on a lot of times on like a four to seven percent downhill yeah just to be able to get that turnover and i'm like D- you know that yep. that's amazing and yeah. it hurts <laughs> it, yeah it does but the better you get at the turnover and the less you put on the brakes the, the less it hurts yes 
And I think that's the hardest part about not living at elevation yeah. and not training at elevation is not the uphill. You can train for that on a Stairmaster, right. Right. on a treadmill, no problem. Right. It's the downhill because that's what beats up the quads. Yeah. And the core. But typically, and you know, I have I have several clients down in Florida, so that was a challenge for me at first because I'm used to dealing with well, go out and do your hill repeats, go climb Kusa, go, you know, get, like right. get get on the power line at Fort Mountain, and then to have people that are flatlanders, it, you know, typically they're running bridges. They're going up and down on bridges. I mean, there's bridges everywhere. So just a matter of finding the longest bridge they can and getting the most right. elevation out of it. Tedious, but, but, <laughs> but serves its purpose. One is one year early on. Oh, what year was this? This had to be like three or four maybe of Georgia death race. I want to say mm -hmm. uh, my buddy, Joe, who was stationed in the military at Eglin Air Force Base mm -hmm. um, down in Florida. Now, the Panhandle definitely has spots that have lots of hills, especially mm -hmm. Eglin Air Force Base, um, the Florida Trail that goes through there. Man, there's some, you know, and it's nothing that's like, oh, my God, it's a thousand foot climb. But you can get a 150 foot climb in there. Mm -hmm. um, but I said, Joe, I said, like, he crushed it. And I'm never, never forgetting. I forget the guy's name. I'm not trying to call anybody out. But he was neck and neck with a guy from Colorado at Winding Stair Gap for Georgia Death Race. So like 40 something miles in. And at Winding Stair Gap, he left the dude like he was standing still. And the guy even told me after the race, he said, I've never been that far into a race and have somebody just like basically turn downhill and just disappear. Like wow. he's like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. The guy lives in Florida. And so I asked Joe, I said, Joe, living in Florida, how the heck do you train to run and win Georgia death race. And he said, well, it's super easy, Sean. You know, I do a, you know, once a week I do, I do a half marathon. I was like, oh, okay. He's like at the track, but I, I, I do walking lunges for a quarter mile. Oh. <laughs> I sprint a mile. I do walking lunges for a quarter mile. And he does that until you would get to a half marathon. It now just Oh. Go. Try, if anyone listening to this is like, oh, let me try something difficult. If you can even make walking lunges for a quarter mile, right. dude, like sign my poster, you know? So oh. for him to do that is just messed up. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Why? 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, it was effective, obviously, but oh, just the thought of it. <laughs> so how did you get into coaching? Like, I know you've done, you still do the personal training, right? Mm -hmm. like you still I do. do I do. Um, I, so up until I was about 34, um, I, I smoked like it was my job. That was my, I guess my first career was being a smoker. And, <laughs> um, so when I, like I was around 30, 33 or 34 years old and I, I decided to quit smoking. Um, I was a single mom with four kids. I got back to school and it was just like all kinds of things happening at once. And, you know, my first midterms were due. My father had a heart attack. I worked in theater then I opened like four shows that month and it was just like everything all at once. And I went away on new year's, the kids were with their dad and I sat in this cabin out in the woods all by myself thinking I need huge change. Like something big needs to happen. And I tossed my pack of cigarettes in the fireplace and I sat there and watched them burn. And I was like, all right, well, I got to find some other addiction. And I got home the next day and I joined the YMCA and it took about three months. It was March 23rd, the first time I was actually able to run. I had been walking on a treadmill and walking on a Stairmaster. And, and when was and this? Like what year? So I'm 52. So this would have been, what, 18 years ago, I guess? Four, okay. Yeah, about 18 years ago. Um, so I, I ran three miles. I kept telling myself, just run three miles. You can go home, go to sleep. And I got it done. I woke up the next day and I thought... If I don't do it again, I'll never do it again. So I started running every day, at least three miles. And then within like six weeks, I was up to almost 10 miles and I was so proud of it. And I was talking to somebody in a coffee shop who had seen me running up and down the road. Um, and he said, you know, you should run a marathon, which hadn't really occurred to me. So I went home and I got on the internet and I pulled up Hal Higdon's plan. And then I found a marathon 18 weeks later and signed up for it. And then I proceeded to run 
around the block to train for it. I would do my long runs running around the block. All four of my kids were still at home, but my oldest was a teenager. So I would put the cordless phone next to his bed and take a flip phone in my pocket. So if, and leave the house at three forty-five in the morning. So if anybody woke up, he could call me and I was never more than a block away from home. Um, and that was how I trained for my first marathon. And then that was in November of that year. And in December, I was at a Christmas party of the Cleveland West Roadrunners Club up in Ohio. And there was a guy across the table who was talking about training for Mohican 100. And it was like this epiphany, like, oh, my God, we can go further. And I went home and registered for a 100 miler. Um, It didn't happen. Every I registered for that same 100 miler for about eight years. And every time I registered for it, I ended up having some like crazy injury or illness or something happening. And it wasn't all running related. And the last time I registered for Burning River 100, I slipped on my stairs and broke my pelvis the next day. And I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm going to take over an aid station. I ended up captaining an aid station until I moved to Georgia. I was like, I'm not, I'm not giving you any more of my money. Like this is like, I'm just going to come help. (laughs) So, um, and then, you know, I, I got back into, I I had completely transitioned out of working in theater and had just started working as a coach, um, being in school full time and raising four kids. It kind of got to a point where like the gym membership was going to have to go. And they told me at the Y that if I got certified in something, they'd pay me for it and give me a free membership. So uh, within like six months, I think I had maybe five or six certifications. And then I ended up graduating and, um, a month later taking the job as a health and wellness director at that YMCA. And I was there for a year or two and then kind of went off on my own to just coach on my own. And when I came to Georgia, I had a job in a gym just to kind of get my, get my bearings here and get my feet under me. And then when the pandemic hit. um, it kind of, it kind of turned things in a completely different direction. I mean, it opened up Zoom, it opened up virtual coaching, and at this point, I have I have clients in Portland, I have clients in Minnesota, I have like clients in Wisconsin, up in Pennsylvania, in in Maine, in Massachusetts. Like it's it's really opened up opportunities for me. So I'm able to reach people that I definitely wouldn't have reached before. So. It was just kind of like a, a natural progression. Like I said, as I, I wanted to take care of myself and figure out how to finish races on my own. And when it started working and I realized like, okay, like, I think that, I think I know how to get this done now. And I feel confident helping other people get it done. Um, then I added ultra running coach to my list. So that's awesome. I love going back to this whole story. It's awesome. I love how like you're running and some guys like, Hey, you should go run a marathon. It's like, (laughs) it's like, I, I, I'm assuming he didn't even run himself. It's just like, Hey, you run this much, go do a marathon. It's like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually um, a local coffee shop that I used to hang out in and all of the, all of the trash collectors, um, would like they would take their break at that coffee shop and I would sit there and study a lot and um they would all come in during their break and have their coffee and their pastry and so I got to know a lot of them and it was actually one of the Cleveland trash collectors that suggested I run a marathon now that is (laughs) awesome now that's not a cool story like yeah that's cool um, so the other thing I want to ask you, the last thing I want to ask you is, okay, you talked about like you took over the health and wellness of this YMCA. Mm-hmm. Um, as a current YMCA member and as somebody who's been a YMCA member for quite some time, we've gone to okay. bunch of their summer camps as a kid, um, you know, led some summer camps there. Um, I still go to the Y and I, when I was at one point, I was very, very injured. I, I, I get ran, as we all do, we get injured. Yeah. And so whenever I'm coming back from an injury, you'll find me at the YMCA a lot because they have a pool Mm -hmm. and I'm kind of that guy in there. And I tell you right now, I have no shame in my game to admit that I've been to those um, 
geriatrics, like water aerobics <laughs> classes, yeah. okay? which is freaking awesome. It was like, I was going for like two weeks, yeah. made like the best friends of my life. These women thought it was awesome. It was, it was like all women. Who and they're like, committed. They're, they're so committed. committed. Yes. They're committed. <laughs> and uh, anyways, it was funny. So my question to you now is, what is your favorite YMCA offered class? You got jazzercise, you got the <sighs> yoga, it's, you got the water aerobics. So I, obviously being the health and wellness director, I had to be certified in everything that we offered because we had like a no cancellation policy. So with, I think I had 16 or 17 instructors under oh, wow. me. And if anyone called off on any given day, I had to fill in for them. So Ooh. I had to know how to teach classes. Um, my favorite was spin and there were days where I would teach four, five, six spin classes in a day, and God. which which you can't really fake those. Like you can kind of fake it when you're coaching like a body sculpt class. You can use three pound weights and you know just kind of fake along or walk around and cue people. But when you're doing a cycling class, like you're you're kind of in it, and I really did enjoy that. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I did everyone a favor and avoided teaching steps at any cost. Um, when, when I got my certification, I told the group that I was in, I said, listen, guys, let me go first for the practical and all of you will pass. Um, they gave me my certification. They said, you know what? You checked off all the boxes, but it, it would definitely be best if you avoided teaching this. Like, I just don't, <laughs> I just don't have that kind of coordination. So no. yeah. So stop was my least favorite. I remember going to kickboxing once with my oldest son. He was a teenager at the time. And I was getting all into it. I thought I was doing a really great job. And he looked at me and mouthed the words, what the heck are you doing? And <laughs> so I just don't, I don't have that kind of coordination, but on a bike, I felt like I couldn't go wrong. Nice. Nice. Well, there you have it. Airbell master of spin. Uh, well, Airbell, thank you for coming on. This has been awesome. Um, where can people well, are you taking new clients? Like where can people find out more information? How can they hire you as a coach or as a personal trainer? Um, so I have a website and it's strongepiclife.com. Um, I, I have, I have various openings for coaching. Like I have room for a couple of personal training clients. Um, when it comes to running clients, it kind of depends on when the goal race is. We're kind of in heavy season at the moment. So I've got a lot of big races coming up, but that also means that I have some clients that are going to be kind of on maintenance level or taking like the summer off to recover from their races. So I have a little bit of leeway there, but I do enjoy like it, I do enjoy meeting people and talking with them and just hearing what their goals are and just figuring out whether or not I'm a good fit for them. Um, you know, clients, clients vary in what they need. Some of them, some of them need more help than others. Some of them require more attention than others. I just really enjoy working with people and I love, I love seeing them meet their goals. I think part of what keeps me really busy is that I do crew and pace whenever I can. Like if it's logistically possible for me to get to a client's race, like I like to be there. I like for me, that's part of part of the the satisfaction or the the gratification is to just see them accomplish things and see how happy they are with it. That's awesome. And 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 I'm telling you this, I have no skin in the game other than as a race director, I don't get to follow ultra running and all my friends and all the people that I'm, you know, Facebook or social media friends with, you know, everything that they do. Um, but it's kind of like you start to notice certain things here and there. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I notice a lot is the people that Airbell coaches, uh, you know, Airbell's told me before we talk on the phone every so often and I call her, try to see, you know, how she's doing, what, what all is going on. And the people that I find that she's coaching, She'll take them from this and then all of a sudden, you know, sometimes people who are, aren't finishing races, maybe they're struggling, maybe they're mid, back, back, whatever it might be. And I'll see her get to refine everything they're doing because like she just said, she's truly looking at what are you doing? What are your goals? And what coach comes and like to a race that you're at 
and paces you or watch. I mean, that to me is amazing. And then watching the people that I'm friends with that you coach, um, you know, just do really well. Um, I'll just throw out here, uh, uh, Kelly Baker, um, also finished, she finished the 50 mile race yeah. at Grayson. I know she was training her butt off for that. Mm-hmm. Her and Sarah Mullins, who we have on today as well. Um, they ran a lot of it together. Um, that was really cool to see. Yeah. Uh, somebody, she also volunteers at our races a lot. So you're doing great things. Um, you know, guys send Arabella a message, go on her website and, you know, hopefully it'll work out. You guys can get, get her as a coach. Um, yeah. Thank you, so Sean. Thank you. thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And if I was coachable, I would, <laughs> but I'm, the, I'm the worst. I'm the worst. Good, I'm not going to question five. you on that. <laughs> 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 All right, girl. Well, I love you and uh, right. best of luck. Uh, what's what's next for you? How about that? I got to ask you. Uh, Damn Yeti 50 miler. So Sweet. yeah. And then, well, my, my, my next big race is Tunnel Hill. So okay. I know it's not until November. Yeah, it's a hundred miler. Um, I just really, I really want to push the speed on this. I've never, I've never really approached a race with trying to finish it fast or having a time goal. Um, I always say like, you know, I just want to get it done. I just want to make sure I cross the finish line, but I feel like I have enough hundreds under my belt now that it, it's probably time to set some time goals and maybe push myself a little bit. So that's the goal with tunnel Hill is to push the speed. So I'm doing a lot of, a lot of speed drills these days. Heck yeah. So, okay, let's go ahead and Babe Ruth it. Like aim for the fences where call, call your shot. What are you aiming for? I would love to get a sub 24. I would, I would love to. Um, My fastest hundred mile time is a, it's like a 2630. Um, And I just really like to, I'd really like to get under 24 hours. So I believe. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I hope you're right. <laughs> um, all right. Well, good luck at all the things you got coming up. And thanks right. again for, for right. being on. Thanks, Sean. Bye-bye. You're awesome. Our next guest here is Sarah Mullins from Georgia as well. One of our favorite volunteers and people. Sarah just finished the Grayson Highlands 50 miler. This past weekend, absolutely killed it. Sarah, welcome to the Ben Don't Break podcast. How you doing? Good. Thanks for having me, Sean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know I love you and your family, so it's awesome to have you on. And uh, so I just want to talk. Okay, so you ran this 50-miler. Was this your first 50-miler? Yes, it was my first 50-miler. So you PR'd on distance at this. So what was it like, and yeah. why did you choose this race to your first 50? Well, Grayson Highlands kind of holds a special place in my heart. It was my first 50K. And so I kind of always knew that I wanted it to be my first 50 miler. Um, So that's why I chose it. And it's my favorite of all your races. I just think it's beautiful with the ponies and the views. Nice. So um, you had done the, you last year you had swept the whole thing, correct? I swept the second, yeah, the second half of it. Yeah. Right. So I know I knew the course somewhat because I'd done the 50K. I think I've swept the half before. And then last year I swept part of the 50 miler. So I, I was somewhat familiar with the course. Right on. And what in like, so prior to this 50 miler, what had you done previously as far as like ultra marathons? I have done one, two. Well, I've done before this year, I had done three official 50Ks. I had done the Grayson Highlands twice, Sky to Summit once. And then this year in training, I did a 50K almost every month, like January, February, March, April. But only January was an official race. I did the fat ass 50K. And then the rest were just training runs. Wow. Wow. So do you think knowing the course, obviously you've done the 50K and so you'd seen the entire course between doing the 50K yeah. route and sweeping the second half. Did that help you? Or do you think that was like, oh God, this is what's going on? Um, I think it helped me. The only part I wasn't familiar with was the Fox Creek loop. I'd never mm-hmm. done that because we started sweeping after the Fox Creek loop last year. That's right. So it was nice once I did that loop and I got back because I knew, okay, I know the rest of the course. So that kind of made me feel a little bit more comfortable finishing the race, knowing I knew what was coming up. I mean, of course, I'd forgotten some parts of it, but most of it I remembered. Right. And so you ran most of the race with your good friend, also our good friend, 
coached by Airbill and yeah. she volunteers a bunch is Kelly Baker. Yes. yes. So Kelly and I kind of had a plan going in to run as much as we could together. We didn't want to hold each other back, but we had kind of said she's really good on downhill and I'm a little bit better on the uphill. So we knew we wouldn't be together the whole race, but we were hoping we could be close enough. Um, so I caught up to her probably about mile 29 or 30. And then the rest of the race, we pretty much stayed together um, and finished it together, which made it more fun. And we knew we were, we knew we weren't right at cutoff. So we had a little bit of time. So we knew it was probably okay to stay together and just finish it out. Gotcha. So did you guys start together or no? We started together on that first trail loop. And then once we hit the road where you go downhill again, I got a little bit ahead of her. And then once we hit the trail again, she got ahead of me. And then I kind of got ahead of her. So we were just kind of going back and forth for the first couple miles. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Did you guys have like a nice sunrise? Well, yeah, I think the whole, I mean, the whole race was just pretty. We had beautiful weather. It was a little hot, but other than that. Nice. So do you think that everything you, like knowing what you knew, like kind of knowing the route a little bit, um, your training, like what training did you do specifically? And do you think that that helped and, or would you change? Anything? Um, I tried to do, you know, I mean, I have four kids at home and two, I homeschool. So getting in runs is not always easy. So I was getting up early in the mornings and doing some runs with friends. And then I would sometimes double up and do an afternoon run. I was trying my biggest, my biggest obstacle was getting elevation mm -hmm. because my neighborhood's flat. So as much as I don't like the treadmill, I would hop on it and do a lot of incline hiking on that. And then on the weekends is where I tried to get majority of my elevation out on trails. Um, the only thing I think I would change is I wish I could have had more time on the trails, but I don't know how I would have changed it just because during the week it was hard to get out there. I got you. I got you. What, um, like, what was your favorite part then about like when you actually ran the race, like a certain section, like running with somebody? I think finishing. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know? And that was just my goal was just to finish. So coming in, you know, since I know the course, knowing once you get to that road, you got to go up the road and then hop on the trail and knowing I was so close to the finish was just, it just felt so good to be like, okay, I'm actually going to do this. I'm going to finish. Right, 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 right. So you had that, did you have that self doubt until like a certain point and then you're like, okay, I got this. You know, the whole day I really felt pretty good. We were, an hour or more ahead of most of the cutoffs, which made me feel a little bit good. Um, so I, I didn't, that was our biggest concern was going into it is that we weren't sure we'd make cutoffs. So knowing we were ahead of them and still feeling good. I mean, they're really, besides there was right when you leave Fox Creek and you go on the trail and then there's that like about four mile hill that feels like yeah. it never ends. I struggled there. Just, I think I was just hungry. I was tired. I was sore. But other than that, I mean, the whole, I was, it just felt great the rest of the day. Besides that little stretch, the rest of the day, I felt great. I wasn't too tired or too sore. Um, I was able to keep up, you know, food and I drank tons. I made sure I drank a lot because it was hotter than it usually is. Um, so really there was not a particular part that I loved or hated or besides that one hill. I mean, but <laughs> yeah, <everyone laughs> and it's not even a bad hill. It just, well, for whatever reason, it's, I had had enough at that point. <laughs> it's just where it is at the very end. It's like, yeah. I have to go back uphill for three miles or two and a half miles. Yes. Uh, so what was your, like, your pacing strategy? Are you looking at, like, your minute per mile, heart rate? Or are you just going on feel? Like, what's your game plan? I kind of just went on feel. Um, Kelly, the whole week ahead of time, was trying to give me okay, we need to stay in this range. Or like she had printed out, she's so funny. She had printed out and laminated the aid station cutoffs. And right. I was like, Kelly, I don't want to hear anything else. I don't want to be overwhelmed. I'm just going to go out there and I'm just going to run and do what I can based on how I feel. Right. So, um, so I kind of just did that and just checked the time to make sure I had, you know, I knew what time each aid station had a cutoff. So just trying to make sure that I stayed under that. You know what? That's awesome. It's interesting that you say that. So like I've seen a lot of people who may or may not be fighting cutoffs, like really just dial in on what the cutoff times are for eight stations and really get like obsessed with that. And I always wondered like, and again, this is just 
putting it out, I've always wondered, it's like, okay, let's say you're like, oh no, you look down, you're like, I have 20 minutes to go like another two miles. Like, yeah. are you just going to like start sprinting that? Like, and then you get there and then you're so gassed, you yeah. still got to get all the stuff you need at an aid station. And then you're still like, and then you're going to, you know, you're going up and then down yeah. instead of just kind of maintaining that. I always thought that was, that would be interesting. I've never experienced that. Yeah. yeah, it was, I mean, we were pretty much an hour ahead of each cutoff. So I kind of felt like we were okay, that we weren't mm-hmm. going to, and we didn't stay long in the aid stations. We had kind of all said ahead of time, we're only going to spend a few minutes in there, in and out, which is hard because, you know, there's a lot of people you know in there and you want to hang out. And, but. I know. It's so inviting. <laughs> it's so inviting, especially with people, because you guys are always volunteers, so you know, like most of the other people volunteer. It's like, hey, that, that was that was actually another favorite part of the event is at every aid station, except for, I think it was Camp Creek. I knew somebody, you know, there was Aiden, there was Mike Jay, there was Kevin. And so it was so fun going into aid stations and seeing familiar faces. And, um, and then that camps where my family ended up being there. So that was just an extra boost to kind of do. So it was fun. I mean, that's, that's the advantage of volunteering. You get to know people and then they cheer you on. That's right. So, you mentioned family multiple times here. Your family is awesome. Uh, let's talk about Katie, your daughter. She runs, she ran the eight miler on yep. Sunday. And I think she was second overall. Yeah, she was second yes. overall. Yes. And she is how old now? She's 12. She'll be 13 in July. Wow. And she's run a bunch of our shorter distance races and keeps yeah. bugging you about doing an ultra, right? <laughs> She would love to do Sky to Summit 25K, which actually I told her if you need sweeps this year, maybe we could sweep it and then she'd get wow. an idea of what the course is like. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, she she would like to do Sky to Summit is her and big, what she wants to do. I love it. Um, and so she's very, she's very quick, right? So she's run, she, yeah. what did she win? She won Helen Holiday or was second at that she won Helen Holiday one year, and then That's I right. think one year she was second, and I think she, and then she won Cloudland Half last year. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so awesome. <laughs> and then I think it's just funny because I used to coach high school cross country at an all Jewish school in Atlanta, which is honestly super fun. Um, yeah. You know, we weren't going to win any titles or anything. It's just about having fun. But it's yeah. it's funny the limitations that other people in society puts on us. It's like, okay, when we have middle schoolers, they run, you know, like two miles or one mile. Yeah. And then once you get to high school, then you go to a 5k, you go to college and a lot of it's five mile and 10k stuff. So it's like, it's like, Oh, well you can't really run that. That's bad for you kind of thing. And I always look at it as just trying to keep the kids smiling and having fun. And and, and Katie even, she was second at uh, Brass Town Ballbuster 5K the That's weekend right. before. Yeah, yeah she I mean, was. So she's she's killing it, and it's, she's having a blast. You're not forcing yeah. her to run. How, no, how do you no, get she loves kids it. into running? Like, how, how, do you, how do you do that? Well, she's the only one of my four that really runs. I mean, my youngest is only six, and she runs, but she's six. Um, and my boys have no interest. But They play you sports, know, we, though. They do. They play baseball, so um, – they started, but when they were younger, I homeschooled all of them. And so once a year, twice a year, we would just train for a 5K. And they've always just come out running with me in the stroller or on a bike or running as they got older. Um, and it just stuck with Katie. She just started cross country and she was good at it. She's super competitive. So the fact that she's good at it makes her want to continue to do it. Um, and so she just kind of, I mean, she, and she's just naturally good at it. She doesn't, I mean, the girl could go out and run tomorrow and win a race without training. Like she just, which is not always the best because then she thinks she doesn't have to train. That's right. That's right. But, um, but yeah, she just, she's naturally good at it. And I mean, my boys are okay. That's just not their favorite thing. And you also picked up a pacer with like 10 miles or so to go, right? I did. My 15 year old, I was very surprised, but Colin said he joined me and, you know, when they're teenagers and they have phones, you don't see them very often. So he had to talk to me because his phone didn't come in and spend time. And I think he had a good time. I mean, he enjoyed it. He, you know, he loves the aid station. So he made sure he got some Oreos and, <laughs> 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 but yeah, he, he did tell me though. I just, 
you know, said, do you want to come pace me? And he said, yeah, sure. And so we started off and he looked at me and he was like, you didn't tell me there were going to be hills. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, did sorry. That, uh, did, you, did you leave him on the last hill? <laughs> no, he actually, he was much faster than me. Okay. okay, okay. <laughs> he kind of led the way, but yeah. Okay. Um, but no, he, I mean, I think he had fun. He enjoyed it. That's awesome. So, and well, it's, again, it's just so cool. So you have four kids, you homeschool two of them. You say it's obviously it's got to be dang near impossible to find time to run. Like how do you, are you waking up at three in the morning to go? To go yeah, a lot of times. It actually was kind of, you know, this, the morning of the race, I woke up at like 3 a.m. And it was kind of nice because I've been waking up at 3.30 to run anyway. So I was like, oh, this isn't, this isn't much different. Um, you know, sometimes I run in the afternoons too, once we're done with our school. But I wasn't very smart in planning my race at this time of year because both my boys play high school ball. So we would have some weeks where we'd have six or seven games in a week. And it was like my husband or, you know, you go to this game, I'll go to this game. Um, oh, so man. afternoon running kind of didn't work out. So yeah, I was getting up at 3.30 in the morning, meeting friends about 4.30, running, and then coming home, you know, getting the boys off to school, getting the girls started on school. Sometimes I would sneak in a nap if I could, but not all the time. And it's so many people have so many excuses and like, I mean, it's like, where do I find the time? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, wake up at three in the morning, you know. <laughs> just don't <laughs> sleep. Just don't, yeah, just don't sleep. It's fine. Coffee's there. <laughs> Okay. Right, just have some more coffee. <laughs> so let's talk about this, if you don't mind. So something that all of that to me is very motivating about everything you do. Um, another motivating thing to me, uh, obviously you didn't have a choice about any of this, um, but I remember last year during Scotty Summit, you had to stop. Um, you, what, the last two years got diagnosed with type 1 uh, or adult yeah. onset type 1 diabetes. Yeah. That's correct. So. So tell me about all that. That's, that's, that's terrible. You know? Well, you know, last January I was diagnosed and I actually had just started training for Grace and 50 miler. Then I had just gone out the week before I was diagnosed with Kelly and we'd done a 15 or 17 mile run. Um, mm. So I hadn't been feeling great for about a month, but I just kind of assumed, you know, I was kids, mom, busy. Um, so anyways, I got real, real sick friend came and picked me up, took me to the hospital and they diagnosed me with diabetes. And I remember telling them when they did it, I was like, but that's not right. I just, I ran 15 miles last weekend, like in one day, I can't have diabetes. Um, I was very ignorant to diabetes and I didn't, in my mind, I was thinking it was people that didn't eat healthy and um, didn't exercise, which is not type one. Anybody can get type one, um, right. which that's I obviously two. learned. Yeah. Yeah. So type one is more you get an infection that attacks your pancreas and it makes it stop producing insulin. So that's when, when I was diagnosed, I decided, you know, training for a 50 miler for the first time was probably not my smartest idea. Um, and then, yeah, I did sky to summit in November and I realized, well, so with my diabetes, my blood sugar will go up when it gets hot and humid out. Mm -hmm. um, when I asked my doctor about it, he said, my body's just working so hard. Well, at Sky to Summit, it was a lot more hot and humid than I planned. And so I had, I thought I would go low. So I had some gummy bears, which made me go high and I ended up getting sick. And um, so that's why I ended up not finishing it. But, which was a concern actually for Grayson this year, because it was hotter. You know, when you were telling us the week before that it was going to be cold, I was probably the only one that was excited because right. my blood sugar does better in the cold. But after Sky to Summit and learning, I just was better able to stay on track of it at Grayson and just check it. And there were two times during the race that I had to give myself insulin. And it, it was because I had Coke at the aid station and I knew, but it was worth it oh. to have the Coke. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it was a shock, but it's, you know, once you kind once I adjusted to it and you kind of figure out your body and you figure out what you need. And of course, I mean, it can change because so many things affect your blood sugar, not just what you eat, you know, like for me, like I said, the heat and humidity, um, lack of sleep, stress. Mm. I mean, there's so many different things that can affect Waking it. Up at 3 <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Drinking too much coffee. Um, right. So, you know, you, it, on any given day, it could have gone a different way. You know, right. I, this race could have gone a different way and I could have ended up like I did at Sky to Summit, Summit and gone sick. But thankfully I was able to stay on top of it and catch myself before I went too high and hydrate a lot. And um, 
So that, that was my big, you know, for Grace and my two goals were to finish and keep my blood sugar under, you know, keep so it in control. Do you have like a constant monitor, like the glucose monitor? I do. I have, it's called the Dexcom and they, it puts like a sensor under your skin. And so every five minutes it records and then it, you can get it on your watch. I haven't done that yet, but it's on my phone. So I just, yeah. like after I went into an aid station and had Coke, a few minutes later I would check it and I was like, oh, I'm kind of going high. Let me stay ahead of it and get myself insulin. Um, if I had not had the Coke, I probably would not have needed insulin, but that sugar just made it go so, pretty so high. There's a really dumb, and again, somebody who's trying to understand. So if you had, for instance, if you had sugar-free Coke, like these fake sugars, like stevia and all that other crap, is that good or bad? I mean, I don't think that's good in general, but like, is that something that you could do? Do you, do you know, I actually have never tried it because I'm not a big Coke drinker anyways, unless I'm running a race. And I'm, I don't like Stevia. So I actually have never, um, I've never tried to see what it would do to my blood sugar. I have tried like sugar-free creamer, which I guess is the same thing. And it didn't really do much, but I didn't like it. So I haven't tried that since the beginning. Um, you know, and with type one, it's basically, you can eat what you want. You just have to give yourself insulin based on it. So I just knew, oh, if I'm gonna have Coke, I need to give myself more insulin to make up for the sugar and, and being a liquid, it goes right into your bloodstream. So it's a lot quicker uh, than if I was to eat something with sugar. Gotcha. Um, so, so you yeah, have, it, so every day are you having to give yourself insulin or is it? Yes. I give myself yes. insulin at night. That's like long acting. It lasts 24 hours. And then before every meal, I give myself short acting insulin. So it just kind of acts for like four hours. So you give it to yourself. You, Figure out based on what you're eating, how much carbs and sugar you're eating, and then you give yourself insulin based on that. So you're just constantly having to add up like what you're eating. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. That's a that's big terrible. mental game. So running and racing, you know, is already a mental game. And then you got to add in constantly thinking about, is my blood sugar going high? Do I need insulin? Do I need to eat gummy bears? Is it going low? You know, it's just, wow. it's constant. And do they know what that's from? Is it genetic? Is it just... Um. It's actually, my doctor said not a lot of people, I forget the percentage, but it's a small percentage of people that have it genetically. Um, it's just, anybody can get it. It could have been from an ear infection I got. It could have been when we had COVID. I mean, it, there's, it's wow. just an infection that anybody can get and at any time. I have a friend that got it when she was probably in her, I think like early thirties and she had a sinus infection and developed into yeah. that. So, I mean, really anybody at any time can get it. Wow. Yeah. Do you ever like, so you obviously have to like have it in the syringe. And, and I have, it's called like an, a pen and you put on a um, oh. pin needle on the top of it and then you put it in. But gotcha. there is another one that you use a syringe with too, but mine has like a pin needle. So I just carry it with me. You know what I path. do during a race is I would like hit it in my thigh, like at an aid station and I'd be like, Whoa, I would just act like I was the Hulk after that and be like, oh, now I got my steroids and you just go and just see what. <laughs> and just go. <laughs> just go. No, I'm just kidding. No, but I, I remember when that happened at Scott of Summit, I was so like scared because like I heard about it and then you got back there and you're okay. And I was like freaking out. I was like, oh, I God, what are we going to do? I know. Your dad had to come pick me up and he teases me at every race now because when he picked me up, he was like, Sarah, you should not be doing this alone. And so now every yeah. race that I see him at, he's like, do you have a friend with you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, he's type two. Yeah, he told yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I remember years ago, years, years ago, a friend who's no longer with us, um, I went and was in Leadville and I was set to pace him, mm -hmm. crewing and set to pace him over Hope Pass. Um, so it's like mile 50 turnaround yeah. back for like 20 miles or something like that. And then the next day, go run Pikes Peak Marathon. And he had not been on top of his insulin game. And um, anyways, he had two, he was on uh, team type one. Okay. Okay. Uh, John Oates, amazing, probably one of the fastest runners, if not the fastest runner I've ever known from Atlanta. Um, and anyways, he had an episode and we we're like, okay, where is he? Where is he? Like he's supposed to be here, but there's no cell service. Yeah. Well, he went all haywire and basically was like wandering on the woods for like like three hours 
Oh, wow. You know, past the cutoff, they're like, yeah, you know, hey, the aid station's closed. They all leave. And I run back up the trail. I find him. Yeah. And we get him down. They hit him with insulin. And he's like, babbling like an idiot. And all of a sudden, they hit him with insulin. Within 30 seconds, he's like, oh, hey, guys, what's up? Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. And I was like, wow, this is the most insane thing I've ever seen. Um, yeah, I, again, I can't imagine having to do that. It was just, that was, that was, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it, you just kind of move on. I'm like, you know, I can't, I can't change it. So I just need to adjust. Right. So to make it there, work for me. Are there certain um, um, times when you can run where it feels better or certain things like you have to avoid eating ahead of time? I do or? better running first thing in the morning. And I think it's because, so for example, today I went running later at around lunchtime. And the problem with that is when I eat breakfast, or really yesterday, it was a big problem. So I got up yesterday and I was like, I'm going to go run. And I ate some oatmeal and I gave myself a little bit of insulin for it. But I was like, oh, I'm going to go run. So usually when you run it, you don't have to give yourself as much insulin. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you can go low. So I was like, I'm going to go run. So I only gave myself a small dose. Well, then the girls woke up and I got busy with them. And the next day I know it's like an hour later and my blood sugar is going high because I hadn't given myself enough insulin, but I didn't want to give myself more insulin. So I was planning on going running still. So I didn't want to go too low. So you kind of got to figure that out. So for me, it's easiest just to get up in the morning, go run before I really eat anything. And it just kind of starts my day. It also kind of gets my blood sugar more even. And I don't, I don't fight as many highs during the day if I get up and run in the morning. So do the doc, like do your doctors, do they recommend that you exercise? Is there a limit on that? or They actually, my doctor, yes. When I was first diagnosed, it was a Wednesday that I went into the hospital and I didn't see him till the following Thursday and I hadn't run that whole time. And so one of my first questions to him when I met with him was, Hey, can I start running again? And he said, yeah, I want you to run. It's good for you to run. Um, and even just walking. So even if I eat and then I go for a walk afterwards, my blood sugar stays more level and doesn't spike as much as if I was just to eat and go sit down. So I've heard yeah. stuff about that before. I, I feel like, um, cause they're like, you can do a bunch of sugar right before you get, not for somebody who's diabetic necessarily, but you can <laughs> eat like some higher glycemic index stuff. And once you start exercising it, you don't get the spike as much. It kind of yeah. plateaus more. Yeah. I think yeah. That's pretty interesting. And that's why a lot of the quote unquote elite runners will pound like one or two gels, which sounds disgusting. To me. Really oh, right does. before a, before a run, like, yo, oh, I need to get some extra gel in me real quick. Um, you know, but they'll do it 15 minutes prior to yeah. a, a workout and it'll just kind of sustain them a little bit. I think yeah. it's, pretty it's really crazy how much what you eat affects your blood sugar and even in how you eat it. Whereas I've learned if I, like if I'm having pasta, let's say, but I start by eating vegetables first and then eat my pasta, then my blood sugar will stay more level than if I eat the pasta first and then the vegetables. It's really funny how uh, many different things affect it. Huh. That's yeah. so interesting. Now, yeah. do, have you spoken with any other type one diabetic athletes or ultra runners to kind of like um, guide you? And stuff? I've talked to a few. I actually, I think I joined a group on Facebook and so they'll post stuff occasionally. And there's been a couple runners at your race that I've ran into. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, so I've talked to a few, but you know, you talk to them. It's also somewhat different for each runner. So something okay. that may work for me would not necessarily work. I mean, you can t- kind of have a general idea, but right. some runners don't have to give themselves insulin at all during a race. And like oh, I said, right. last week I did, I think not if I hadn't had Coke, I would have been fine. But, um, so yeah, it's just different. And then, you know, sometimes different weeks, I could be higher than other weeks. So it's kind of a guessing game sometimes. So what is your main, what are your main go-to foods during an ultra? And are you eating constantly? Are you, what, what's that look? Um, well, I love it. All your aid stations, I ate a lot of the, um, avocado wraps and cheese quesadillas. And then I carry in my pack, um, gummy bears in case I go low. Cause it's just a quick sugar fix. And then I carry fig bars because those are kind of a good, um, if I'm starting to go low and I had these little muffins this last time, um, I carry peanut butter packs too, because it's a good, it's a good fuel, but it doesn't have a lot of sugar or carbs to make me go too high. Um, usually though, if I'm running, I can eat more carbs than say if I'm just at home. 
So I'm usually so if okay. If you're just at home, what are, you, what are you eating? Like, are you supposed to do like high protein, high fat, low carbohydrate? I do a lot of high protein and low carbs. Um, so for breakfast, a lot of times I'll do eggs with a lot of vegetables. I eat a lot of vegetables. Um, for lunch, I do like cheese or um, lunch meat with vegetables, carrots or peppers, um, tuna or salmon. For dinner, kind of the same thing. I do, if I do pasta, I like to get the protein pasta. Okay. And I'll do a lot of vegetables or like even meatballs or some type of meat with it and just very little pasta. Again, I can eat more. I just have to give myself more insulin if I do that. Ah, gotcha. Yeah. Oh, I can't imagine. Well, I, I mean, I'm so glad that you, it seems like you got it figured out. Um, and I think you told me like earlier on when you were dealing with all this, like it all changes based on time, you know? Yeah. You know, it fluctuates and it's like, I, again, being a mom of four and Having to deal with this is just, I mean, that's crazy. So congratulations on- Thanks, thanks. Yeah. 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 Um, so last thing I'll ask you is, um, what would be your number one recommendation to people for training for Grace and Islands, whether it be the 50K or 50 mile, like, yeah. I would say make sure you get elevation don't just run on flat. And I would say as much as you can get in trail running, not just, I mean, for me, it's easy to just walk out my door and go in my neighborhood on the street. But I think for Grayson, you definitely need to get in some trail running, especially with all those rock beds um, and some elevation, even if you're just hiking it, just get in some elevation, whether you're on the treadmill, whether you're going to trails, but just get in definitely some elevation. Cause it's, I mean, there's a lot of hills. Yeah, there's not a lot of flat, you know. I don't think there's no. as much steep, steep, but it's like I've definitely done way steeper stuff. But it's yes, just well, like Sky to Summit, I think is steeper. Sky to Summit is like what I would call a true mountain race. Not yeah. saying Gracie isn't, but it's yeah. You're not. I, I don't know. It just seems like a lot of the grades are more gradual. Yeah, you know? I agree with you. They it's are not like this. It's more like that. <laughs> yeah. But if you're right. not doing any elevation, I mean, you're going to start feeling it. A hundred percent. One hundred percent. Well, that's great. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for everything. Yep. Thanks for Thanks being for on. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. It's been awesome. And yeah. uh, I hope people listening to this have learned a lot, gotten inspired. If you have four kids and type one diabetes, then now you go, <laughs> here's the game plan. And if you, you don't, go. you have no excuse to not be <laughs> kicking ass like Sarah. <laughs> All right. Well, hope to see you soon, I'm sure. Okay. Hopefully next what, weekend. I think we're coming to Quest. You're coming to Quest? Well, what's your next run? Like, were you like, oh, my God, I did this 50 miler. Now I've got to go sign up for 350 miles across. No. no. I actually <laughs> said I was one and done and I would never do another 50 miler. Uh, but one of my friends, Lindsay, didn't finish Grayson and she wants to do another uh, 50 miler. So I said, okay, okay, I'll do another one with you. So I may, okay. I may be doing another one. But you right go. now, you know, I hate summer running. So right now it's just going to be fun. I, uh, I was having a um, big shout out to Paul Tilly, who, as of the airing of his podcast, finished the Hellbender 100. Did he? Um, I saw he was doing yes. it. Yes. Yeah. The, the timing, the live timing tracking or whatever was, I would say, it was interesting. Um, I saw worked. some people say it was hard to follow. Like it wasn't. Do it. I don't know something. They said it was. It was interesting. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'll just say it was interesting. I don't know. Yeah. Worked part of the time. I, I I wasn't glued to it. I was kind of hard to, uh, but it, it it looked cool. And anyways, I got I actually got to follow and see that he finished. So that was cool. Oh, that um, is but good. I think he had a tough day in the heat. That's why I mentioned that. And as a he's full on ginger. I'm like a day walker. You're fair skinned enough. You're like a day <laughs> walker too. We don't handle heat. We want to no, be no. in the snow picking potatoes. That's yep. what we want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the summer for me is just like, okay, just go, go run on the treadmill or, That's, yep. or go north or something. <laughs> I'm like, keep a good base, but I don't want to train for anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's why I think fall, fall, uh, hundred mile races and stuff like that, like stuff in September, early October is so difficult. Any I agree. Cause you got to yeah. train through the heat of the summer in the yeah. South, which is. It's not fun. No. Brutal. No. All right. Well, good luck at the next 50 mile Thanks. or whatever, and Thanks. we'll see you soon. Okay, sounds good.
Again, we had an amazing race this year at Grayson Highlands Trail Run. I have to say, everyone always asks me this, and they're like, Sean, what is your favorite race to put on? What's your favorite race to drag? And honestly, this probably is it, just because uh, it's our largest race, but really, and there's a lot of work, there's so much behind the scenes that nobody really sees unless you're volunteering. And even then you kind of only see part of it. Um, but I would say that this is probably my favorite race just because it's the most scenic one that we do. Um, and I think that standing at the finish line, it's really awesome to see eight miler, half marathon, 50 K 50 mile people coming across the finish line are all smiles. They're just jacked up. It is a very tough finish to all of the races because it's uphill. We start and finish on the top of the mountain at the highest point at, uh, in Grayson Highland State Park. So there's no easy finishes. So you kind of feel like you totally earned that. Um, but really, it's just, it's so beautiful. There's such a wide array of scenery. And obviously, you have the ponies. So we always say, come for the ponies, stay for the views make friendships and just come for the experience overall. So big shout out to everybody who took part in this. I'm really excited for that. Um, I'm excited for next year. We open up registration Tuesday, May 16th. I want to thank not only Arabelle and Sarah for being on here, but again, my parents for helping out, Deanna for being my co-race director, Wendy being behind the scenes, uh, Marcy and all of Grayson Highland State Park, staff, the rugby search and rescue volunteer fire department. Those guys killed it with the rescue that they did. Also the U.S. Forest Service, Mount Rogers Ranger District, uh, and everybody else who made this event possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if you get a chance here in the next couple of days, we will have all of our race photos uploaded. Uh, Emily Schaefer and Misty Wong had some amazing photos. Scott Abshire, Scott of Pants, had some epic drone footage we're going to take a look at later on. And some, uh, I think he just went one day and was playing with the ponies and recording that. So I can't wait to see how that turned out. Um, so sign up for next year's race. And if you're looking for races in the interim, I have several events in the fall that are open up now. We have Sky to Summit, which is Georgia's highest and most scenic trail race. Last weekend in October, there's a 25K and a 50K. I have Wild Florida uh, 50K, which is a point-to-point -point 50K, 100% benefiting the Florida Trail Association. So all proceeds benefit them. Um, and then that, there's a 12 and a 6 miler as well. Uh, pretty shortly, we have hopefully Cloudland Canyon Trail Race in December opening up. Uh, what else? Forgotten Florida in February is 100 mile, 50 mile. And of course, a 15 and eight miler at that as well in February. Stupid beautiful. Come run that. And I think, uh, oh, and Georgia Death Race. Uh, we have a couple trickling spots in there when people uh, take their names off the list. So, all right. I hope to see you guys at another run. And this coming weekend is Quest for the Crest 50K, 25K, and 10K. This is our last race of the year, this is the highest race that we put on going up to almost 6,700 feet. The highest point is the Mississippi. So we like to finish the season on a bang. And then after that, it's going to be all fun runs and running other races and traveling around running and heading for the fall. So for everyone who's made our entire season possible, I want to say thank you so much. I love you guys all. And I love this stuff, if you can't tell. So we'll see you guys soon enough. Take care until the next run.